Hi guys, this is Sean Dyer coming to you today, uh, representing a Civil War surgeon. Um, I neglected to do it in my last video, and I'd like to do it uh, today and in all my future videos. I, I wanted to dedicate videos and recognize people that's made a positive impact in my life. So I'd like to dedicate this video to my loving and beautiful wife, who has uh, allowed me and sometimes encouraged me to participate in this hobby that I love. Uh, I also like to dedicate it to my students who constantly keep me on my toes and I miss terribly during this time. Um, but I know that they are keep their nose to the grindstone and they're doing their work and um, adapting the best way they can. Definitely living through a historical time. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, my family, my extended family, uh, my colleagues in the educational field, uh, my fellow reenactors, especially the medical reenactors that have made an impact on my life, like Andre. Thank you for the inspiration. Um, and before I get started, I also like to direct your attention. There are a lot of really good videos right now on the American Civil War. Uh, the ones that inspired me the most is Civil War Digital Digest. They do a fantastic job. They make sure to include primary resources uh, or pri primary sources in their videos as much as possible. Same thing with the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. Cavalry. Um, those guys do a great job bringing what a horse soldier's life will, um, to the screen. So thank you guys for all your work. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, my buddy Andre, who uh, represents a Civil War surgeon out of Pennsylvania, he's also put up a video detailing an amputation kit. And I'm very thankful for that way. I don't have to dive into the amputation kit aspect of it. He did a great job comparing a couple different um, amputation kit manufacturers. So check those out and get a chance. All right, so today, I'm going to talk to you guys about tourniquets and the importance of tourniquets, the different styles of tourniquets, um, a little bit how they're going to be used, and um, and how our contemporary understanding of tourniquets and its use it has is very different from the historic understanding of a tourniquet and its use. Uh, I'll start out explaining that. So today, if you were to join the military, you would go into uh, a basic um, first aid course that would be combat first aid training. And they show you how to use a tourniquet, the importance of a tourniquet, uh, the style of tourniquet that you would be issued, um, and various other ways that you can stop blood flow in an emergency situation. Your soldier at the American during the American Civil War was not given that kind of instruction. Uh, instead, and if you were a soldier and you had a basic knowledge or understanding, maybe you just kind of picked it up from seeing surgeons, you may take like your cravat or a belt or something, uh, whatever you can to get around the limb to stop the blood flow. However, since you're not trained, knowing exactly where different arteries are to make the most impact of a tourniquet, uh, you're not going to be very successful. So that's unfortunate. And because of war, uh, casualties, and as we learn from different things, uh, we currently do teach our soldiers how to take care of themselves and how to take care of each other in a combat situation. So there are two main types of tourniquets. There is the surgical tourniquet, most commonly known as the petite tourniquet. That's going to be the most common style. However, there are various other styles of tourniquets that are out there uh, for that purpose. But the U.S. military is going to pretty much stick with the petite style tourniquet and issue those in the amputation uh, kits, cases. The other type of tourniquet is going to be a field tourniquet. Now, there was a variety of different field tourniquets. And the whole purpose of the field tourniquet is it was expendable. So it's going to be cheap to manufacture, to send out to the troops. In fact, they're going to come in packages of 12 when issued to hospitals. Um, if they get left behind, if they get damaged, if they get lost or whatever, it's no big deal. And relic hunters of the American Civil War, especially around the hospital areas, do find relic uh, field tourniquets. Now, I'm going to show you three different styles. The first style is going to be the most basic 
style tourniquet. Um, this actually came from my archer case, but this style was known to exist. It's in um, several of the uh, books. If you were to get on Google Books and you were to look up some Civil War books, like um, a treatise in the minor surgery uh, and a treatise into military surgery, you're going to find um, this style, not ex quite exactly, uh, the style that you're going to find in those books does not have this piece of wood on it, um, but it's pretty much just a strap and a tined buckle. Now the tined buckle would have been used to lock into the strap, so as we put this on, you're going to get it to where you want it. This little part right here, this wooden is going to go over where the artery is. And then you're going to take the teeth. You're going to poke it through the cloth, and that's going to hold it in place. Now, this is easily the most basic type of tourniquet besides using a belt. Okay. Um, Again, the success rate of using this type of tourniquet is not going to be as good as, say, an amputation level tourniquet, like a petite tourniquet, um, or a slightly different, a um, little bit more expensive style of field tourniquet. The next style of field tourniquet I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two examples. One is my original. Okay, so when we talk about primary sources, uh, primary sources would be like an artifact, and you're going to base what you know and understand off of that artifact. Uh, the books that I mentioned earlier, like the Treatise in Minor Surgery and Military Surgery, those are good primary sources. Um, but a picture is only going to get you so much. So I have with me an original, original teardrop tourniquet. This one here is made by Evans and Company, Old Change London. Now, we know, based off of that stamp and knowing uh, when that company changed names, that this was made in the 1850s, okay? Right before the American Civil War. The Civil War lasted between 1861 and 1865. Now, this tourniquet, just like the other one, is going to have the pad. This pad has uh, leather. This covering the piece of wood, and it's going to have, very similar to the other one, a buckle. And this one has a roller here. So this is a little bit more functional as a tourniquet, as far as higher quality um, to help the person get tighter. The roller is going to help facilitate that. Uh, but again, this is really uh, not much different than the, other, the first type I showed you. Uh, but it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be a little more reliable, but it's going to work about the same. I have a reproduction tourniquet. So when we talk about, again, primary sources and secondary sources, I have no idea when this reproduction was made. I assume during the 1990s. Uh, I haven't been able to find any like this for sale except secondhand. And the only other one that I've seen like this uh, uh, another surgeon or Civil War surgeon reenactor from um, the southern part of Ohio, he has one. And, uh, but that's the only one that I've seen besides this one. So again, it's a teardrop tourniquet. It is smaller in size, significantly smaller in size from my primary source. So understanding the primary source versus secondary, that's a good thing to know. This next tourniquet, it's a field tourniquet, but this is going to be more of like a private purchase tourniquet. There are various examples of officers purchasing their own field tourniquet. So if they do get harmed out in the field during the battle, they can take care of themselves, right? Or possibly take care of someone else. So this style here is very unique, and it is an original, so it's a primary source. This one was made by Weiss, or Weiss, I don't know how you pronounce it, in London. Um, and its teeth, let's see, I'll show you on my hand here, its teeth are on the outside there, as you see. But it works the same. It has some rollers in there to strap it down. And once you strap it down, both hands, like so, you would bend it up and the teeth would grab it. 
So very basic field tourniquet. This style, based on the catalogs, we know was made in 1863. Now, we would have sold it after that, but we know for sure that this style, based on the catalog, a primary source, was made in 1863. Now, the other tourniquet example that I have for you is not a primary source. It is a secondary source. It is a petite tourniquet. This came from a reproduction Archer medical case that I own. Now, a petite tourniquet has basically three main brass components. Or, yeah. So your first one's going to be your screw here. The second's going to be your middle section that's going to raise up as you twist. And it's going to have the bottom. Now, as you can see, the bottom is curved so it can fit on the limb and be precisely placed. Same thing with this pad here. It's movable, so you can adjust where you're going to put this on the artery, and it can stay fixated. And it has another two-tine buckle with a leather flap. A leather flap just to make sure that it stays out of the way. Really no practical use besides that. So the reason why the petite tourniquet was used in a hospital situation versus a field situation is this is going to cost more to make. It's also heavier. It's a little bit more wieldy. Uh, you can be more precise with it, so it's more of a precise instrument. And, and you can decide more precisely how tight you want to turn this or to add pressure to the artery to stop the bleeding. Okay, those of you who may not know, maybe I should have done this at the beginning, but in a situation where you have bleeding, uh, that's essentially basically your life force that's leaving out of you. You can only lose so much blood. So stopping blood flow is going to be important to make sure that you have an opportunity for survival. Now, uh, most of your wounds that a surgeon is going to take care of are going to be your extremities. The closer that you are in towards your center mass, the less chance you have of surviving. We just didn't have the technology that we have today. Uh, we also have, um, we have infections that we didn't have, or well, we have today, but we have medicines to fight those infections. Uh, during the American Civil War, we didn't know exactly what caused some of these infections. We knew that uh, ventilation, for example, was extremely important to, for a successful uh, patient recovery, but we didn't exactly understand why having more open space, air flow is going to help. We just know that it works. And we're going to discover things during the American Civil War that is going to surprise us, but we're not exactly going to understand the why. When we talk about scientific method, uh, you pose a question, you can do an experiment, and you can it helps lead to an answer. Well, we're certainly experimenting with things. Uh, there is uh, the story, hypocritical possibly, but there's a story that in the South that they ran out of um, thread, suturing wire and thread. So they would use the horsehair tails and they would throw that horsehair in a boiling pot of water to make sure it's pliable and they can use it and they noticed that um, healing from those horsehair sutures was better than by cotton sutures for example and of course now we know that boiling things will kill bacteria and kill certain germs etc but yeah, we're going to learn things from experimentation. Um, after the American Civil War, there's going to be an explosion of medical knowledge that's going to come from this. Going back to the whole point of tourniquets. Without a tourniquet, no matter what style that you have, then you, you're not going to be able to stop the bleeding. And if you don't stop the bleeding, then the person's not going to be able to get to that field hospital that's a mile away, just out of cannon fire. Um, you have early on in the war where people are left on the field for several days uh, just due to a lack of uh, functioning ambulance service. Thank you, Jonathan Letterman, for solving that for us. Um, but there was a possibility that all those lives could have been impacted 
if they would have had training on how to use a tourniquet or if we would have issued tourniquets to all the soldiers to make sure that they could um, help themselves and help each other more. Uh, but you live and learn, you know, looking back as 2020 vision. So without further ado, tourniquets are important. Um, you're going to find at a reenactment your surgeon who's going to do their operation on a leg, on an arm, or whatever, they're going to use a petite tourniquet. However, out in the field, out in the field, when you have um, possibly a hospital steward or an assistant surgeon, just to get them from the field to the hospital, they're going to use field tourniquets. Not most likely not this style. They're going to use the uh, the teardrop style because these are the most common style that you're going to find in. Um, hospital sites being dug up, etc. So the teardrop style is going to be used from the field of battle where a wounded man can get to for uh, the first level of service and then they get taken by an ambulance to the field hospital and that's where they're going to get the amputation and the petite tourniquet is going to be used. All right, so Maybe I can have another discussion later about the ambulance department because that's honestly one of my like favorite areas of research and reading that uh, I have found on this medical side. I thank you for joining me. I hope it was informative. I hope um, you might have learned something about it, especially when we talk about primary sources, uh, comparing and contrasting, uh, et cetera, and understanding a little bit more of how so many soldiers died during the American Civil War versus the recovery rate of what we have today in our contemporary medicine and knowledge, even just functional knowledge. Uh, I alluded to the ambulance service, but even functional knowledge of teaching people a basic first aid so they can take care of themselves and others and providing them the proper tools to succeed in that area. All right, please leave any questions or comments that you have. Uh, I thank you for joining me during this uh, little miniature lesson. If you have any questions specifically about any of the instruments that I demonstrated today, drop me a line. I'll see if I can answer them or maybe I can do a little bit more research into it because I like doing that, I like researching. All right, have a great day, stay safe, have fun, be close to your loved ones, and thank you, take care.